He is multiple winner on the PGA Tour. He's a major champion, the Open champion, and a player's champion. And he is Justin Leonard, and he's on our podcast. Hey, brother. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I so appreciate you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I've honestly been looking forward to this conversation for a last time. You know, I've watched you throughout your career, you know, come up, win majors, win big events, you know, be part of winning Ryder Cup teams. And I've always been fascinated about how, as to how you've played the game, because, you know, you and me, we sort of undersized, but you were a giant killer of your own sort. So I've looked forward to this because there's so much that folks can learn from you, in my opinion. But before we get there, Justin, um, I, I want to take a step back. You, you're now in your late 40s. I'm fabulously 51. Um, let's go back to Dallas and growing up in the game. And you were a bit of a, a childhood prodigy, really. So, so tell us some about that golf as a junior, things you could pass on just to advise young kids playing and maybe parents listening. Well, the, the thing... For me, growing up in Dallas, which, you know, a lot of golf was played, it was year round. Um, I was around players that were better than me. Okay. Uh, even growing up at Royal Oaks Country Club, when I was 13 or 14 years old, I was playing with the 15 and 16 and 17 year olds. Mm -hmm. um, and they were hitting it 30 and 40 yards by me, just as some guys did, you know, once I got on the PGA Tour. And so it, I had to find a way to compete. And I did it by you know, a really good short game, managing, managing my game, all of those things. And, you know, while I'm sure some of those high school guys didn't enjoy um, having to play with a 13 year old, um, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself and how to, how to kind of compete when um, I wasn't the strongest, I wasn't maybe the most talented, um, but I worked my tail off and I loved it. And for me, golf, it was always about putting the work in and trying to find ways to get better. Um, and it's something I've been able to do and in transferring into broadcasting mm -hmm. something that, that like, I'm able to scratch that itch and trying to continue to get better. But I was always around players. Uh, you know, I played a lot of junior golf with and against Trip Keeney, um, who, you know, went on, played at Oklahoma state, won the U S mid amateur. Um, he never turned professional, but he certainly could have. And, you know, there was another kid when we were 12 or 13 years old by the name of Jeffrey Wolf. And he played cross-handed. He was from Fort Worth. You know what? I remember that name because we lived in Dallas in 1985. And I, at the time, was 15. And I do remember that name. I, I, that, that rings a bell for me. I mean, he was a foot and a half taller than the rest of us. His arms seemed like they were five feet long. And he played cross-handed, everything through the back. And at 12 and 13 years old, we couldn't beat this guy. Neither right. Trip nor I. And so... That was like, there was always something out there that I was chasing is my point. Um, you know, I, when I got into college, Phil Mickelson was in college. David Duvall was in college. Stuart Sink was there. Brian Gay. I mean, I, I played against these great players. There was always something. So there was always somebody out there that was pushing me to find a way to get better. Even within my own team, there were guys at University of Texas that did things that I couldn't do. And so trying to glean a little bit of information from them. Um, you know, I was always, I always felt like I've been a student of the game and always trying to get, take some information in. And if I could make it my own, I would. And if it just really didn't play very well in my mind or in my swing, those kind of things, then I would just let it go. All right. There are a few things I've got stuff spinning around in my head that make it, <laughs> that make it my own thing. I, I, I want to drop the anchor over there in a bit, but before that, yeah. Okay you talked about continual improvement, you know, playing with the best, playing with better than you, striving to get better. To me, the shadow side of that is like, okay, there are frustrating days. There are days when stuff hasn't gone your way. And, and as a junior golfer, adolescent, all the stuff going on, hormones and the like, uh, there's folks probably watching this and parents too going, oh, my kid is just so down right now. Uh, any advice you could share about dealing with those days? Well, they're going to happen in the game of golf. Yeah. I mean, it's a four letter word for, for a reason. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's one we can all say we don't always want to at times. Uh -huh. um, that, and, and it's also like, that's part of life too. I mean, you know, I've got four kids. Two of my boys play some golf. Uh, one played as a freshman on the high school team here. Um, and he's like every day, like, how come my scores aren't improving? I go, it's not always 
your scores don't always tell the story. Um, unfortunately, that's how you measure yourself as a golfer to other players. Uh, but as a junior golfer, you can't be so focused on the scores. And so, you know, me with my, you know, background in the game with yours, it's a little easier for us to see and, and to see improvement, to see, look, you're, you're climbing the ladder. The scores aren't there yet, but at some point the light bulb is going to go off and there's going to be a huge leap. And I think that's something that, that parents and junior golfers need to keep in mind. Keep putting the work in. The scores aren't, aren't always indicative of what's going on with your game. And I always had kind of a longer range forecast. Okay. Um, it's really, it's so easy to get caught in the short term because why you've got a scorecard in your pocket, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to go post a score um, either to compete with your buddies or maybe you're playing tournament golf. Um, but to have that kind of long range uh, kind of view of things, I think is so important in the game of golf. And I think that also helps those moments when there are struggles to keep you from beating you down into a place that it's even harder to come out of kind of having that long range of, okay, this is what I'm building towards. Um, it's not about right here, right now. It's about three months or six months or a year out. Um, you know, we're moving to Florida next summer. The golf obviously is much more competitive down there at a high school level. Um, so, you know, my 15 year old, he finishes his season up here plays okay at times. And he's like, you know, my scores aren't getting better. I go, okay, well, let me tell you something. Your scores are about to get worse because we're going to make some, we need to make a few changes so that you're ready to play in Florida. Mm -hmm. A huge high kind of over the top cut does not play very well in Florida. Um, it's fine here in Colorado. The air's thin, the wind hardly touches the ball. Uh -huh. You want to hit it as high as you can. You want to put as much spin on as you can. That's not going to play in Florida. So we, he's like, he bought in. We went out the next day, started making some changes with the swing path, things like that. And um, he's shooting better scores, not as well as I would say he's, you know, hitting the ball. But a lot of that's just the learning the nuances of the game, reading putts better, um, you know, better short game, those kind of things. And so, um, you know, it's interesting. I think it's just so important whether, you know, you've got a, a brand new junior golfer, a college golfer, or a professional, you've got to have your eye on the long run and long term to make when you're making decisions, as far as your game, things you want to work on, those kind of things. Um, you can't get so focused on the here and now because the game of golf, if you do that, it's going to beat you up quite a bit. It's one of the reasons, Justin, you talk about the broadcasting now. Um, to me, one of the great voices in the game, tremendously insightful without a statistic. <laughs> and so many folks in our industry you know, have got a strokes gain metric they can just plug into the argument, and this makes something gospel. And I love to watch you and Brandle on live from because you're just a perfect foil for him. You know, he's well-researched. He's got all the information, all the data and stuff. And then you just always come with the holistic side of a take where you're like, all right, that's fine and dandy, but now let's turn up the pressure a little bit. And all that stuff goes out the window and you've got to be like, well, it's time to sack up and basically have a shot. And so what I guess I'm trying to get to here is you've always, to me, been a guy who sort of does it his own way, even when you play it. So I'm imagining now as a junior golfer, you're under the tutelage of Randy Smith, correct? Yes. Legend, Hall of Famer. Love him being on the show. I, I'm, I'm curious because everyone wants to get better and we're all wanting to try. And then someone else is doing this and it's so easy to look over your shoulder and say, well, maybe I should try that. Yet to me, always, it looked like you just stayed your own course. Comment on that a little bit, please. I've, I'm a big believer in kind of turning things into your own and taking ownership. Um, mm -hmm. I at times fell out of that uh, to where I was looking outside for too much, uh, whether it was information or, or help or those kind of things. And, and so I, 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 in looking back on my career as I have over the last few years and towards the end of my playing career, I realized that I was, I was so much better off with a little bit of instruction, but making it my own. And so, you know, and Randy was so good over the years of kind of teaching me why things happen. Um, 
you know, building my golf IQ to where I understood things. And the hardest thing is when you struggle to, um, it's easy to go away from that. It's mm. easy to go, okay, well, you know, okay, what am I doing? What do you see? You know, how, how was that swing? How was that swing? How was that swing? You know, and I would get in this process where I would fall in the trap of, you know, working with somebody, you know, Randy Smith every day. And after three months of, okay, it's not really getting much better. I realized like, I'm not making it my own. And so, um, you know, I applied that lesson later in my career, certainly applying it now with my son, Luke, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's, you know, he would love to have me there watching him, him hit balls all the time. And I say, you know what? No, you need to go do it on your own. You need to go figure it out. Um, you know, call me halfway through, tell me what's going on, what you see, but you kind of need to go do this a little bit because it's so easy to get. Yeah. If you have access to an instructor, the way I did with Randy, it's easy to fall in the trap of, you know, getting a little too much, becoming too reliant upon it. And so um, I love watching players on the PGA tour who, yes, you know, most everybody out there has a coach, but they're not there watching every swing um, there. And I understand there are times when players are working through things, they need a little bit extra, um, but the players that tend to kind of make it their own and, and that they kind of, you know, they, they travel, they kind of do their own thing the, the way I did. Um, that's what I gravitate towards. Cause I feel like those are the guys that if something goes a little, you know, askew during a round or during, during a tournament, I feel like those are the guys that can kind of figure it out and, and fix it for themselves. And, and it's usually not very complicated. Hey, along those lines, um, Colin Morikawa, I know you've got high respect for him. We all do. I mean, for the game, the guy possesses, he and his coach Rick have been on here and Colin said how Rick would introduce the concept to him, whatever it might be, and then just let him be and let him go about the self-discovery because then to your observation, ownership happens and then you can sort of get your sinking ship back into the port with limited damage during a round. Um, pivoting real fast. I watched you play one time, it was at the uh, US Open at Olympia Fields. I believe you were, you, you certainly paired with my brother who I was working with at the time, Trevor. And I believe Ernie else was in the group. And I was struck not just at your wedge game and your short game, because that's like a symphony to me, but the confidence you had in yourself, because it's so easy to be paired alongside an else or one of those generational sorts of people, not that you weren't, and to sort of get wrapped up in the other individual's game. Now you played in the Tiger era. I want you to talk to folks about this because confidence is such a fickle deal. And, and it goes so quickly if we get ourselves wrapped up in something, someone else. No, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of, one of the difficult tasks is to find confidence in ways other than just the scorecard. <laughs> um, it can't be just about what you're shooting. And, huh? and that's what I try and, and relay to my son, Luke. It's what I try and do as I've played a little bit more over the last few months in my own game. Um, is, okay, am I comfortable? Like, am I comfortable hitting a variety of shots? Uh, because I've always moved the ball around, not big curves, but little bit, because that's how I control my distance and my height. And so um, do I feel comfortable hitting those, those smaller shots? Not your full stock eight iron, but instead of it going 150, like if there's a little bit of wind, and am I comfortable hitting it 135 to a back right hole location? Um, you know, those kind of things. That's something you would practice, obviously. Right? You have, yeah, I think you have to practice it mm -hmm. and, and find ways like that to build confidence because it's not always going to come from the scorecard. And you're right, it is so fleeting. Um, you know, and trust me, I left, I lost confidence plenty of times in my career. And I think I found ways to get it back by doing, trying to do the things I do on the golf course more in my practice. Um, trying to hit those little shots. It wasn't just about stock numbers. And, you know, I, I'm not a big launch monitor guy. I understand why people use them. Um, I think in a, a majority of cases, they're overused. Mm. Um, I like to hit little shots and move things around. I think there's a time and a place for getting your numbers, uh, but you're not thinking about numbers, those kind of numbers, spin rates and those things, unless you're Bryson DeChambeau when you're on the golf course you've got to create. And so I found ways and Randy helped me 
find ways to create my practice. And I think there were times when I struggled, when I got away from it. Um, I remember a particular instance when I'd stopped working with Randy uh, and I was working with another instructor and I was down in San Antonio. I hadn't been playing well for a while. And I, I knew Randy was going to be down there. He had a couple other guys, Ryan Palmer and Colt Nose and Harrison Frazier. These, he was going to be watching. And so <clears throat> I said, Randy, could you come watch me play six holes? This is on a Thursday or Friday because it's very different from Wednesday, as you know, mm -hmm. to when the bell goes off. And so he watched me play. That's he the, watched me play. Go ahead. Oh, wait, I want to stop there. Sorry, sorry to interrupt yeah. you because I, yeah. I don't lose that train of thought. But I need yeah. the golfers listening to this. And this is coming from a major champion looking at me. The difference between Wednesday and Thursday is like the North and South Pole. And you guys feel it the same way than the, the average club golfer does when you're just practicing with your buds. And all of a sudden you're in the club championship. Am I right? <laughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> cool. And the thing about people playing in the club championship, they only get one major a year. At least I had four opportunities. <laughs> um, but, you know, so, so Randy came out, Randy came out and watched me. Um, and then I talked to him after the round. I said, what'd you see? He goes, dude, you're, you're trying to hit the same shot every time. He said, that's, that's why I was lost. He said, go back and start creating. He said, create on the range, create before the round. So that when you get on the golf course, you're moving the ball around, you're creating. Again, it's not going to look like Bubba Watson out there. Um, he said, but move things around, hit some different shots. So I got involved in that process. All of a sudden, the swing thoughts kind of went away. Uh, and I was simply watching like divot pattern and ball flight. As far as, okay, you know, how does a divot look? And is the ball starting where I want to and curving the right direction? Uh, and so from then, like, completely got out of the funk that I was in because he got helped me get back to playing the way I did. And I think, so, you know, the trap of, of getting into just hitting one shot, too much golf swing. I see it a lot. I, I think, I'm guessing you see it a lot. Uh, the guys that go out that really move it around, uh, and again, not big curvature, but, but, you know, yes, they have confidence in whatever their stock shot is, but they also have the confidence to maybe go left to right when that's not their normal shape, when they don't really see that direction as well. Um, you know, that's where confidence comes from. And that's not really related to the scorecard. It's about what you're doing out there. Uh, but I think it's so important to the things that you try and do on the golf course to bring into your practice and not get so wrapped up in a golf swing. Hey, uh, I'd love your take on this one because I'd not, I'm, I think accused is a lazy term that was used, but I was working with an elite player, PJ Tour player, and it was the same sort of thing. You know, it was all data, all golf swing stuff, adjustment constantly. You know, it's like chiseling. Eventually, you're going to chisel through the statue of David if you're not careful. And I said, he was hitting like a weakish standy up cut. I'm like, I said to him, honestly, this is Wednesday afternoon. Just hit a few draws for me. And so he does, and he starts hitting them, and the ball starts going better. And after about an hour, I hear this, can it be that simple? And I was like, well, the truth of it is, is that you fix a fade with a draw, and you fix a draw with a fade kind of thing. Could it be that simple? Now I'm asking a major champion. Well, what's your take on that? <laughs> well, it, it should be that simple. Yeah. Um, it, it's we are, as humans have a way to complicate things. Mm -hmm. uh, and with all the data that's available, all the strokes gain information, you know, launch monitors up to our, you know, right there at our fingertips, uh, and certainly at the professional level, it's so easy to bog down in those things and start to overanalyze, overthink. Um, I, I play the best in my career when I kept it very, very simple. Um, and that's what, you know, I try and, and teach my, my boys that are playing. Um, it is find ways to make the game simple and going back to, you know, making it your own. It's like, there may be something that, that I see in Luke swing that I, you know, it's like, okay, how are we going to correct? You know, he's getting too steep. How are we going to correct that? Okay. And so you go through two or three things you think, okay, well, does he think, can he think more about the club head? Does he th need to think more about the right elbow? Does he need to think more about you know, the hips. And so understanding how he understands his body. Mm -hmm. And it, like you said, the hormones, he's 15, he's six feet tall. He's, you know, 150 pounds. 
um, you know, there's, there's the ability for a lot of movement exactly. um, and trying to make things simple to where he understands it. I know you as, as a commentator and an instructor, you know, when you're working with students, you have to kind of, you have to get in their head a little bit and see, okay, what, how do they think? What do they, you know, how can they relate to certain movements, whether it's, you know, chipping and getting the club face open, whether it's in the full swing, those kind of things. And I think the better a player understands how they think, that's when they can start to put things in their own language. Um, and that's why, like, going from teacher to teacher to teacher to teacher, I think players that do that do themselves a disservice because you never get to develop. It takes some time to develop a rapport with an instructor um, and vice versa with the instructor, with the student to understand kind of how they tick, how they like to think of things. And once you get to a point where you kind of speak in the same language, um, then you can really start communicating. But that communication takes some time. Well, I'm glad you said that. I mean, you and I both as broadcasters and, you know, player, teacher, our other roles, uh, my message is only as good as what it's understood. I, I say that often. I mean, I can have the best stuff in the world. If you don't get it and I'm working with you, then our, our relationship is destined for disaster. Now, right. now to this, you speak of Luke, tall guy, probably hits it a bunch off the tee. Um, that is our game right now. I want Justin Leonard, who was the master of wedging from like 120 yards and in. Um, talk a little bit about this distance chase, because I think sometimes people are losing the forest for the trees. And I think the numbers are beginning to bear it out because that hole just blister it anywhere and find the thing and hopefully play. They, they're firing holes in that stuff now, and there's still golf courses that need you to play the precision game. What say you? Well, I, I think fairways, certainly it's not as important as it used to be, but it's still important. I mean, it's harder to control a, a, a sand wedge out of the rough than it is from the fairway. Um, I think there's, you know, a lot of players these days, like they, they, they try and hit it as far as they can waiting for that week when they hit the majority of the fairways. Um, and the way the tour is set up with, you know, the purse and the points and everything, like you can have a very nice career doing that. Um, I thought it was great. I mean, thinking back a couple of weeks ago when Rory McIlroy won the CJ cup, um, he turned a very reachable par five, probably with an iron into a three shot hole. Why? Because yeah. he didn't need to hit driver. Um, you know, I think the players, there's a time and place. I think some players maybe use it meaning their length or try and take advantage of it maybe a little too often. Um, and then I think, you know, I think of Tony Finau, a player, I think he almost plays too conservatively off the tee. Oh, yeah. I think there's times when he needs to use that length. Look, I don't think we need a rollback in anything. I, I really enjoy the game the way it is, the way it's played at the highest level. And I think the way it's played makes it easier and more fun for, you know, amateurs to play. Um, I don't hit, I mean, I hit the ball 300 yards now because I live at 8,000 feet. Um, you know, and I know that's going to go back the other direction when I get to Florida. Um, but I, you know, also I'm not trying to hit, carry the ball 300 yards because it kind of goes against my natural DNA. If I could gain five or 10 yards with the driver, um, but not lose any accuracy because I'm just more comfortable hitting the ball from the fairway because a, I'm not as steep going into it. I have less control than most from the rough. Yeah. And so for me, it's still, I'm comfortable playing from the fairway, um, you know, playing my game and not trying to emulate what the best players in the world do. That being said, you know, I experiment here and there with, you know, especially with the driver swing, trying to hit a little more up on it, um, you know, trying to use the ground more because I was, and I still am, very more, much more rotational in my golf swing. Um, and even with the driver, it's funny. I was at Jupiter Hills um, with Brad Fax and tinkering around and, and we were practicing. Both my boys were out last weekend uh, and it started raining. So what did we do? We went inside to the teaching center. Mm -hmm. Well, the teachers there, they didn't have much going on. So all of a sudden we had Brad and like three <laughs> instructors um, on the pressure pads and the mat hitting ball and video which was, you know, I know I just spoke against that, but I think every once in a while, it's fascinating. Yeah, it it's the first time, Mark, that I see my swing 
on video that I've actually seen my swing in like six years. Oh, really? um, and looking at it, I'm like, you know what, that's, that's kind of how it feels. Hmm. Um, but there's interesting with the pressure pads, you know, trying to get a little more weight <clears throat> into my left heel at impact and past impact rather than more in the front of my foot. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something like I'm going to tinker with a little bit, but you know what, if all of a sudden I go from hitting 10 fairways around to eight, I'm probably not going to do it. But every once in a while, if I've got it, you know, Hey, there's a bunker out there 270, uh, and I need to, I need to really smash it to carry that bunker. Um, you know, it's something I might, okay. Think, you know, transfer more in the left heel, those kind of things. But, you know, it's not something that I'm going to overhaul things uh, to try and get better. You know, my DNA is my DNA. My swing is my swing. Um, but if I can add a little bit here and there along the way, I think that's what we're all trying to do. The Reverend Justin Leonard. He's pretty. <laughs> I, yes, the number. I sound like Brandle to you now. This was Lou Stagner, who was on the show here recently, been on a couple of times. We did a thing called Managing Your Expectations. Yep. He just threw some little known statistics at folks to say, hey, consider this. These are the elite players in the game. Maybe you should take it easy on yourself. And right. the one was from 140 yards in the rough, the PGA Tour player hits the green one out of two times ever on average. So 50% green in regulation from 140 yards off the fairway. So that's backing up your point about finding the fairway off the tee. Um, all right, let's talk about it. You are a master with a wedge. Always have been, probably still are. I haven't watched you play in a while. Um, and I think you've led us into the secret, but I want you to talk about it. it. You always flatted the ball so beautifully to me. I mean, you hit it in the air if it needed to be, but the ball was always traveling to the flag to me. Um, moved the shape a little bit, draws to left flags, cuts to right flags. So let's talk about wedge play and let's help folks improve what I think is very important because... To me, if you get good off the tee, you will make fewer big numbers, right? Because you're going to hit the thing far down there. But if you get good on shot number three, you're going to make bunches of threes and fours. And you did your entire career. So share the gold, please. So when I was growing up at Royal Oaks, junior high school, uh, there was a guy that I played a lot of golf with. He played at UT. His name's Gary Webb. And then he played um, basically at the Corn Ferry Tour level for a number of years. Um, and I loved watching him hit wedges. Uh, and so we hit the ball very low and I just, I watched a lot, uh, not big divots. These weren't gougy low. Uh, they were like kind of swept off the, the, the grass low and that's how he controlled his distance. Um, and from, you know, inside of a hundred yards, he's almost as good as I've ever seen. And I mean, I'm comparing him with Steve Stricker and Zach Johnson, who I think are, <laughs> you know, kind of two guys that I really look for when I'm going to watch a player hit wedges. Those are the two that I go to. Um, and they both have a lot of similarities. Um, there's not a lot of speed at the ball. Um, there it's, the ball's not picked, but it's almost just squeezed against the turf. Um, and, you know, very shallow divots and they control it with height. And so that's something that I always, you know, in my practice, I work on, I work on varying the heights and basically, I want to hit it as low as I can and still hit the appropriate shot because then I'm taking spin off, you know, spin just adds another variable to it. Mm -hmm. And obviously you're playing a, you know, a U.S. open at Beth page black, you have to put spin on it. Yeah. Um, but day in day out, that's not the case. And so controlling spin, trying to get the ball on the ground as quickly as possible. were, were two ways uh, that, that I, or two things that I always thought about through my wedge play growing up and even to this day. Let's get into the skinny, the nitty gritty of it. Um, you, I guess, never stretched a yardage on a wedge. If you were between clubs, you'd sort of go with a longer club and give a little less if conditions allowed, correct? Yes, because anytime I was trying to get a little, you know, an, a little extra out of a club, especially a wedge, my tendency was to pull it. All right. uh, and I, and I got the yardage out of it, but I would, you know, I would cheat. I would set up to the right as a right-handed golfer and try and kind of shut the face a little bit. Uh, and so, yes, you're right. I was always, if it was two yards outside of my comfort zone, uh, I would go to the next club up and, and then just take some yardage off. Is it me? This is a general statement and you can get into trouble on social media and podcasts with it, but I'm going to do it anyway. 
is it me and you reference Strix and he's been on the show talking about wedge play and Zach Johnson too and you and Max Homer talked about to me how he learned from watching Zach Johnson play but a number of the great wedge players you included even Ernie else to me um never really hit the wedges very very hard at all uh, unless they really needed to settle those things down in, on like a u.s open green am i right you're absolutely right i mean the firmer the greens uh the harder you need to hit it because then you have to put spin yeah. on it uh but by and large week in week out it's more about control it's mm. more about understanding there's there's five different ways to hit a ball 87 yards with that particular club and it's choosing okay what's best for the whole location for the firmness of the greens for this lie that i have and for whatever conditions are going on you know above the surface meaning wind uh, and kind of understanding and being somewhat comfortable with all five of those shots and, and there aren't five specific i just picked yeah. a number yeah. um you know but i'm primarily a right to left player and so i like to feel like i'm drawing my wedges which takes spin off it keeps it down uh, one of the reasons I, I always felt comfortable in the wind, uh, because of, you know, I was, I was very comfortable taking spin off, but when I get to harder greens, or maybe it's a front pen over a bunker, those kind of things, uh, then I, you know, it's simple. I feel like I cut the wedge. Uh, now I, I realize it's not going to go as far, uh, but I can hit it harder because of that feeling. Uh, it gets a little higher, puts a little more spin on it. So again, talk about trying to simplify the game and draws and cuts do that with your wedges. I mean, I, you know, I've worked, not really worked with, but, but been asked questions by, by young players. I was captain of the junior presence cup as your brother Trevor has been um, and talking about wedge play and moving the ball around, understanding if you have three wedges, like just because your number falls in the parameter of your 54 degree, doesn't necessarily mean it's a 54 degree. Um, you know, you might be better with your pitching wedge or, you know, maybe you're comfortable or the green's a little firmer. Maybe you do hit, you know, your, your more lofted wedge hard. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and so I think it's being able to factor all those things in, um, and how do you get quick enough at it to where you can play within a certain level of time? It's practice. It's, it's not dumping a bucket of balls and hitting one club. Um, it's hitting to different targets. It's hitting different numbers. Um, you know, Zach has, you know, he gets so dialed in on his numbers. I've been to his course where he plays a lot of his golf when he's at home at Frederica. Mm -hmm. You go to the back of the range, he's had concrete plates poured uh, at three different numbers. And so, you know, he'll pull back and one day that far plate is, is 97. Uh, the other plate will be 91. The other plate will be 84. And he'll work on those numbers to where he understands, like, with this club, this is what it feels like to hit at 84 yards. And it's not necessarily a, you know, some guys have to go to, okay, I want this to be at, you know, nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, wherever it is. Um, how that's, that's everybody's own personal, um, you know, the way they think, but understanding, okay, I have confidence hitting both of these clubs or all three of these clubs, these certain numbers on under certain conditions, those are the types of wedge players that I love watching. And I think those are the guys that have a true understanding um, of, you know, what it takes. I mean, Ernie, to me, he cut most everything, but mm -hmm. yet he had the ability to, you know, to cut things down a little bit and hit those little draw shots. And, and, you know, for somebody who could drive it as far as, as he did and as he does now to have that good a touch and understanding of hands and how a wedge works um, it's almost unfair. Two more questions about the wedge game. One, do you advocate moving the ball around in your stance for different shots or were you sort of one ball position and a very body alignment? Uh, I, I think you have to adjust. You have to move the ball around. Uh -huh. um, I'll hit some shots with the ball almost on my back foot. Right. Um, I, I would say I stay in the back half of my stance. All right. All very right. rarely do I move forward um, unless I'm, I'm very close to the green and, you know, trying to open the club face up and those kind of things. But mm -hmm. for the majority of wedge shots, say outside of 50 yards, uh, I've got it somewhere in the back half of my stance, meaning, you know, middle of my stance to my right foot. But yeah, there's times when I'm, you know, and, and the key is it's still, when you get it back to stay shallow, you can't get diggy because that puts spin on it and that shoots it up in the air. So 
you know, understanding the golf swing enough to be able to shallow it out, even when you have it back. And I think a lot of that just came from, you know, growing up in Dallas, Texas, windy conditions. Uh, you know, I played junior golf in Abilene and Wichita Falls and, and some in East Texas. And so, you, stop the um, wind you know, <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got to be able to move the ball around and hit it off of different turf conditions. And I think growing up like that helped me, you know, become a good wedge player. Uh, I'm going to show off the golf nerd in me uh, and I'm going to talk about the Brookline Ryder Cup in a minute. Um, but you hold a wedge there. I can't remember. It was on a par five. It was in one of the couple's matches. It was a back hole location and you hit this ball. It flew in there a little lower, landed, jumped, checked, just sort of dropped into the back of the hole. But it was one of those where you could see a change in arm speed and not the big full follow through. So I want to talk to, I want you to talk to folks about just softness of arms and like follow through size on the creation of these wedge shots. Yeah. And to me, it all starts in the grip pressure. Um, you know, a, a tight grip makes it very hard to feel your arms and, and control the speed. Uh, so I, I always played with a very light grip pressure, especially in my wedges. Uh -huh. um, and then just the practice of, of controlling distance. That's why, you know, if you've got, say there's a green out there that you can practice to start at 80 yards and hit multiple shots and hit multiple wedges, taking speed off. And I think getting comfortable with taking speed out of the swing uh, and still hitting the ball, you know, making good contact. Uh, to me, that's the key to good wedge play mm -hmm. is, is, you know, being able to slow things down enough. I love watching Justin Thomas with a wedge. I love watching him play golf, then, yeah. um, you know, to hit it as far as he does and, and the foot action, you know, is something I cannot repeat without, you know, a surgery lined up in my very short future, but to watch him control the speed of his arms, uh, and slow things down. Um, you know, he's, he's an example of understanding the club, his golf swing, but also just creating, creating different shots, depending on what's, you know, what shot he has there facing him, um, and, and really being able to as quickly as he can move to be able to slow down that much and control things. Uh, it's, it's awesome to watch. Learned that from Jimmy Johnson, who had worked for Steve Strecker. So there's a thread through there because Strix was mm. one of the masters at it. Okay, let's pivot to the putting. Um, you know, if people toss out um, uh, contenders for one of the great putts of all time, you'll be up there with the one on 17 <laughs> at Brookline in the Ryder Cup. But I want to ask you this. Um, when you won the Open at Troon, um, it was 98, I think it was. 90, 97. 97, forgive me. Um, yep. 98 yep. Was Larry. You hold a putt across the green. It might have been on 15 or 16. And the conditions were horrid out there. And you know those greens over there, there's not big movement, but they're humps and hollows and all sorts of stuff. And you hit this thing across the green from like 40 feet. And it was it had one destiny. And that thing disappeared like a homesick mole. And I remember that sort of icing the event for you. So I want to ask you, 17 at Brookline or that putt, I don't know if it was 15 or 16. Which one to you, looking back on this, was the better putt? Well, the better putt was at the Open. Um because it was it was perfect speed it was perfect line i mean six mm -hmm. feet out i knew it was going in uh the one at brookline it was i mean let's just face it it was going too fast yeah. um that ball had to hit dead center the hole in order for it to go in it did and it still wouldn't have surprised me this day if it would have popped out the back mm -hmm. um you know it was also a putt not really trying to make i mean I, it was 45 feet up a pretty severe slope you know breaking pretty sharp to the right as it got up top uh it's one of those under those circumstances i, I was just trying to get it within three or four feet um and you know get a two putt and and understand that you know uh my opponent that day hose and all of the had to do the same thing yeah. uh, so the putt at the open was more makeable um you know the putt at brookline like I, I was pretty fortunate that it went in. Okay. At the open, I'll, I'll, I wouldn't forget this as long as I live. And it spoke to me again about the confidence that we referenced earlier. And you've got a great way of doing this. And I'm envious. Look, we all want the stuff that we don't have. Like I also want to drive the thing far, but I get jacked up and I get excitable when I announce and I go too fast. We're at the acceptance ceremony at the open. You're standing there with a claret jug in your hand. I can only imagine. 
And you stepped up to the microphone and you, I could see you were overcome with emotion. How could you not be? I mean, I'm emotional now talking about it. And you were like, a moment, please. And you just kind of gathered yourself. And then you delivered this presidential type acceptance speech that I was like, holy smoke, you should be in public speaking. So here's the question. Help golfers, you know, when we're in that moment, whatever it might be, the five footer to win, the first tee shot, just to, you know, just settle stuff down, direct the focus and try and do your best. What's your take? I love the, the football analogy you hear a lot for, especially quarterbacks going from college to the NFL about how much faster the game is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that relates to all sports. Uh, the game, it sometimes can get too fast yeah. and the great players are able to slow things down. They're able to take a moment, um, collect themselves and get back in their, their normal kind of mindset. Um, you know, it's, you make a bogey or two starting out, or you make a big number on the first hole. And all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, here we go again, you know, those kind of things. I've had those thoughts. Everybody's had those thoughts, but, you know, understanding that's when it comes more to that kind of having that long-term uh, view of things and not getting so wrapped up in the here and now. And that's when you can kind of slow things down a little bit as you have to, when you're on the golf course. You know, going back to that speech, um, I was so locked in that day. I mean, I was five shots back going the last round, playing the next to last group. Uh, and I was just focused on making as many birdies as I could. And so towards the end of the day, I knew I was right there. I didn't exactly know where I stood at all times. Um, but I knew if I kept making pars, throwing a birdie here or there, that I, I had a good chance. I was able to do those things. So it really did, you know, then you go in, sign your scorecard, watch the final group play out. All of a sudden I'm standing there in the 18th green and the press secretary had handed me a, a note card with, you know, the, the secretary, the, the, you know, some of the club officials, um, you know, those kind of things. So I, I kind of read through those a little bit. And then he had the name Barkley Howard, who was the low amateur that week. And, and I remember watching him on Thursday or Friday when I had already finished he was on the, the coverage over there on the BBC. Um, and so I, I spoke just, you know, 30 seconds on him and the Walker Cup. And, and, you know, then all of a sudden when I really kind of started thinking about, okay, what does this mean to me? That's when I had to take a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I thought about Randy Smith. I thought about my parents. Uh, and instead of like trying to like push through it and say something, you know, that nobody would understand, I, I just backed away for a second. And um, literally those three or four seconds, it seemed like a minute as I was standing there on the green, but it was literally three or four seconds where it's like, okay, I you collected myself enough. And, and, you know, it was divine intervention, being able to speak clearly enough about kind of what it meant um, to me personally, to, you know, my, my family and Randy Smith, um, you know, it was certainly divine intervention. And it's, you know, it's funny and wonderful in that over the years since I've won, I've had more comments about my speech <laughs> than I've had about any shot that I hit or the way I played. Uh -huh. um, and so certainly not a bad thing. It's just something that's interesting. Is it a conscious thing? I mean, when you, cause I've given speeches before and sometimes you get onto that autopilot thing. Um, and then you getting a bit overcome. Was it conscious where you were like, okay, I've just got to step away. Was this, or was it just completely reflexive? This, uh, this move that you made? No, it, it was reflexive. It was, um, I mean, literally it, I just kind of started to grasp what I just accomplished at that moment, uh, because I'd been so busy trying to get to that moment. And so, um, you know, to take a minute and, and kind of, collect things. I think it's something I don't do often enough in television. Um, you know, the, the doing the live telecast, as you know, a lot of times you've only got four That's seconds, far. six yeah. seconds. It's yeah. happened so fast. Yeah. Uh, it may be later on the weekend when there's only, you know, two or three groups still out, you've got more time. Uh, but certainly doing like studio shows, doing live from with Brandel, um, there are times when I'm talking because we've got three minutes on a topic, 
that doesn't sound like a lot of time, but in television, it really is. Mm -hmm. And I know Brandel's going to take two and a half of those minutes. Um, and so I'm going, okay, you know, 30 seconds, but even still, sometimes I'll be mid sentence going, where am I going with this? Yeah. Okay. So just take a second, you know, and, and, and I, especially early on, I used to listen to a lot of the shows that we did because they're replayed and everything. And so mm -hmm. I would hear myself say, um, you know, all that in between. And that's, I was trying to give myself a second to think. And that's something that I'm still working on is just, you know what? It's okay to take a pause, similar, yeah. to, to, to just take a beat, collect myself. I'd rather say something, you know, in less amount of time, that's more understandable than just talk because it's my turn to talk. Uh -huh. um, and I think there's, you know, there's times in, in our business and in all sports, I feel like commentators talk too much nice. um, and it's okay to let kind of let the, the, the picture on people's screen, a lot of time it speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I've gotten more comfortable with and need to continue with because there are times when I can't add anything to what's going on on the screen. Uh, and so why even try? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that, that, I, in my experience as a broadcaster now, I see it in other sports as well. Um, you know, we're paid to talk, but we're not paid to just jibber jabber. Like we're paid to entertain or inform. Mm -hmm. And so I think discovering that line is something that uh, I've gotten better at, but it's something I can still improve upon. I don't know. I think you're doing pretty well. In my opinion, you're one of the best. Hey, listen, I appreciate your, your time. I've kept you for a long, long time. Just one more. Um, yeah. I asked this to minds that I, um, that I appreciate. So I want to say this to you. And all the things you've won, I think you've won 14 PGA Tour events in your career. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You've won a major championship. You've won a Players, Ryder Cup winner, the whole thing, a celebrated broadcaster now. If you had something to do over, as you look back on it, and you were writing your memoirs, would there be such a thing? And if not, no stress. Um, well, 12, I won 12 events. Thank you for the extra oh, two yeah, though. I really appreciate that. Um, I, if there's a shot that I could take back, okay, right. I got to relive it a whole lot about a month ago at the Ryder cup. It's number 18. Um, I was, I had a one shot lead playing the 18th hole, uh, came up a little bit short. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of an odd shaped green and, and I came up a little short. I didn't get the ball up and down. So that's the one shot when people say, well, is there one that kind of got away? Certainly it was the PGA in 2004 mm -hmm. at Whistling Straits. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think I, I took myself in the game way too seriously early in my career. Um, you know, I was kind of seen and I, well, I, I was seen as being kind of dour, no personality or sense of humor. Um, I think I took the game a little too seriously. The good thing is that I was playing well. And so it seemed to work for me at the time. Yeah. Um, but I, like having the perspective that I have now uh, about the game, you know, my place in it, but, but really understanding more the relationship that players need to have with the, the fans that are there in attendance um, to the tournament staff and the sponsors, you know, being able to be on, on the broadcast side of things, I now realize the importance of that. And I got better at it later in my playing career, but early in my career, there were certainly, you know, times when, you know, golly, I could have handled that better or, you know what, why not stay an extra 10 minutes and sign autographs? Yeah. Um, and I mean, Steve Sands loves to bust on me because he was, you know, as his job was after a round, asked me a couple questions. And as Steve always does, you know, he'll say, Hey, do you have a moment moment? And one time I walked past him, I go, you know what? I'm going to pass. And he <laughs> brings that up to me and jest all the time, but it's like, why did I do that? Um, and so <clears throat> I wish that I just would have had a better understanding of everything outside of what I was trying to do. Uh, I think um, uh, I, I certainly could have put a few more smiles on people's faces as I was playing uh, and certainly before and after rounds. Um, I, I was very kind of 
um, myopic in my view and self-centered as a lot of great athletes are. And that's why I appreciate, I really appreciate the athletes that aren't, um, that seem to go above and beyond to, you know, to do the right thing for fans, for sponsors, for television partners, all those things. Um, those things really stand out for me. And I wish I would have done a better job of that, especially early in my career when I was playing so well and had a platform like I did. So we'll stand out. You're outstanding. I appreciate you joining us. I appreciate your time. I love your work. Um, folks want to find you. Is there social media they can go and check you out or something? Uh, yes, Jay. Well, I see. I changed it. Jay Leonard golf. I think it is at Jay Leonard golf on Twitter. It was, um, it was Jay L mountain man or something. Wasn't it? it was. And then when, when we made the decision to move to Florida, I thought, okay, I can't be Jay L mountain man down there. So, um, yeah, Jay Leonard golf. And then I think like Justin Leonard O2 or something on Instagram, you know, I look, I'm not, really heavily involved in social media but if like there's a bear that's eating a pumpkin off our front porch this time of year that's i'm it. and i've got a picture of it I, that's the type of stuff i'm going to post fantastic thank you so much for your time justin i appreciate you mark my pleasure thank you <laughs>